I particularly appreciate your concern for my need to make sure that none of the food had kryptonite, and I truly, <laughs> I truly appreciate your kashrut sensitivity. Um, now, so I want to firstly say that um, it, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here um, among friends. Um, some people around the table I have known for the better of like 20 years, 30. <laughs> we don't want to admit the truth. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's in, it kind of auspicious in a certain sense because just this last week we read, you know, Achrimot Kedoshim. And I, I, I had not in my mind thought, like, okay, it's, you know, it's another year. And I got a call from the Orthodox Balkore of the Minyan I attend on Monday. And he said, Steve, I, I didn't want to read the verses in Leviticus without asking you, what should we do? Um, I don't feel comfortable with you and Steve and Amalia, my daughter, in the room and not having this conversation with you first. It was incredibly moving. And I said, you know, you should do nothing different. He said, my son said that I should read them softly. And I said, no, I don't think that's right. I said, let me get back to you. But firstly, you should just read the verses. And then I went back and until two in the morning, I was kind of cogitating and I began to write. And I wrote a piece and I had a prayer for Yom Kippur that I'd written long ago that never really got any traction for what a community could say before Yom Kippur, because it's read, you know, uh, Leviticus 18 is read in, in traditional shoes. Mm -hmm. And um, I reconfigured it and uh, got some help with some better, a little bit better Hebrew from some very good friends. And we basically, in, in two days, came up with a piece that actually went viral on Times of Israel and was in the hands of lots of Jews of different stripes, but even in my community, and I really kind of feel like we, there's, a, there's a move afoot where, where empathy is winning out and slowly, because of the reality of people coming out in younger ages and families having to deal with it, um, so new religious, um, a new sense of religious urgency and willingness to contend, even though that doesn't mean halachic change in the minds of most but nonetheless, a certain kind of responsibility to the fact that there's a 15-year-old probably in their shul who's closeted, fearful, and needs to know what this means. So um, I come to you with a certain sense that, you know, most of your communities are already past that space. Um, but my community is catching, slowly catching up. Um, I would have to say here in Los Angeles, not so much. Um, and that's why I am part of an effort with JQI, J Jewish Queer uh, you know, International, um, and the Los Angeles Foundation, Eshel, the organization I started for LGBT Orthodox and Hasidic Jews, is working with Asher Gellis of JQI to expand our work inside Orthodox Institutions, day schools, shuls. Um, do you want to, uh, is that, if you want to move closer, I would be very happy because I see you're a little, a little bit. Um, or maybe just, you'll be okay? I'll try to. Okay, good. <laughs> it's really, it's right. Okay, so um, let, let me begin by um, saying that uh, the issue of marriage is not all, only about the issue of homosexuality. It is um, about the issue broadly of community, communal order, of uh, uh, attitudes toward nature, uh, attitudes that are deeply rooted in a certain theology of, uh, of creation. Um, uh, they are, they're, they're deeply rooted in the way in which communities understand themselves, individuals understand themselves as gendered beings. Like the laws of marriage are not just incidental to a community's frame, they are core. They're core, it's like they're, uh, how do you say this? Um, when the when the the Mishnah Navot says, you know, where are you from and where are you going? So it's a wonderful set of questions that you could think of beautiful, lofty answers. And what's the what's the answer of the Mishnah? You remember, from a smelly drop mm -hmm. 
to worms. worms. So I lo- it's like, I, I, you know, Woody Allen probably never learned the Mishnah, but sex and death are really the mysteries of our existence. It's like how we appear and disappear and how shocking both are to our consciousness and how, how much we presume them to be present. And if we think about it, it's, it's actually difficult to look it in the eye. So no, we don't talk about death because we can't look it in the eye that we disappear. And birth on some level is joyous, but it's also, it's also transcendent in the extreme. And marriage is the frame that kind of like, you know, on some level, you know, it, it, it pulls on both of these strains because marriage is really about this next generation. And marriage is in a certain sense has, though you don't want to say it too loudly, it has frames of death in it. Whenever I counsel young, young people, particularly young men who have a difficult time committing and finally have done so, I say to them, now you are prepared to do this. And he said, well, you know, I've gotten engaged and I'm, yeah. I said, because you do know that in order to get married, you have to actually, you know, you have to be a murderer. And they look at me and say, what are you talking about? I said, well, there, there are a thousand possible lives you can leave, you can lead. And to get married means to take a dagger and murder 999 of them. Are you ready? Uh, I don't use that line so much anymore because I don't want to discourage people <laughs> from marriage. But of course, there is this sense that like, marriage really is about the kind of like the, the end of the fantasy of immortality and multiple and any opportunity, right? So on some level, birth and death are like they're inside of marriage. So it's no surprise that it's not... There's even people who aren't religious feel they are standing in front of something yawning and terrifying under the chuppah. Why? Be, you know, like, so I just want to put in the frames that, that there's, there's something that we as rabbis need to be fully aware of, is that this is not the ritualization of a nice moment. We are literally carrying people across a Rubicon that actually holds the fears and awesomeness of life and death. Right? And so on some level, we, we owe it to them and ourselves to fully grasp, because on some level, it's, these are avenues into religious life. They're openings into religious life. And to miss them, to, to, to miss them is to actually deprive them of, to deprive them of an opportunity to kind of like experience transcendence like, and, or acknowledge it. Like, I'm feeling this, what is it, right? So, all that said, um, I, what I want to do, two things, and there's, there's, the material isn't voluminous, so it's mostly a few suggestions about how I have struggled with um, same-sex commitment ceremonies that I got in trouble for doing a number of years ago, so much so that a hundred rabbis wrote a Torah dec- dec- declaration, I think, in... 2011 or 10, basically, uh, uh, you know, yelling at me. And so, well, you know, I, I told the couple, this was in D.C., and I said, you know, let's not put this on the internet. And they said, of course not. And one of their friends blogged it with pictures and called it a wedding. And I was, a, I was avoiding calling it a wedding, a commitment ceremony. And so the first openly gay, the blog said the first openly gay, the first Orthodox rabbi who does a gay wedding (laughs) with pictures of two men under a chuppah with me standing, like it was like, and so literally 24 hours later, there was 100 rabbis basically asking me to jump off a cliff. So (laughs) here you go. I give you this. There are a bunch of texts um, around, you, I mean, you know them that the flood didn't happen until men married men and men married animals. You don't remember this story? This, so this is a midrash. That the flood, God, uh, the evil of the world did not strike God as terrifying until men 
were marrying men and men were marrying animals and women animals were having mating across species and so on some level I want to put on the table that homosexuality in little form and homosexual marriage in big form is translated culturally as profound chaos profound chaos and uh, you know, of all the things that the rabbis are going to use to explicate in their in their tradition in their customs, don't go is men marrying men among the other lists. So, so I, I think it's we have to put on the table that there are there, and this is why I'm teaching this. Um, I'm involved often in environments where. People who have hesitations, emotional or otherwise, for welcome, are made to feel embarrassed around their emotional hesitations. They're nervous about the transgender issue. They're made to feel bad that they are uncomfortable because they have to be welcoming and everyone in the image of God. And on some level, I think the discourse suffers because we don't give thoughtful, and patient voice to the opposition. What I want to actually encourage you to think, this is a pretty Hartman-esque and it's Greenberg-esque, is that un until we fully get the, the sensibilities that are salient of the opposition, we actually have a weaker position ourselves. And so on some level, it's not, Hill doesn't quote Shammai because it's, you know, expedient. He's quoting Shammai because Shammai may have an insight that he needs to incorporate. So I want to read this to you. I, I use this text. It's, it's a preamble to the study. I use this text toward that end, and I want to show you how else I use it. I use this text to talk to teenagers about homosexuality. Um, someone please read. We can, um, I'll, I'll read the Hebrew and we can translate. Um, so there's a man who uh, 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 who married a woman and they were both poor I assume and she died and he had a child to nurse he didn't have the money for a wet nurse and his breast began to produce milk and he nursed his child. By the way, biologically possible. Mm -hmm. The milk isn't so great, but it still, <laughs> still works. Um, I'm a Rav Yosef. So Rav Yosef hears the story. Bo, come and see. How great this man was. That a miracle like this was done for him. Amar lo Abaye. Abaye says to him, Just the opposite. How bad this man was. That all the orders of nature were changed for him. So, um, I want to share with you what, what I do with teenagers first because I think it's important to know how to... Uh, and you can see my questions here, which you can use or not use there. I, I included a piece from a curriculum I once did for teenagers. You can see it. But basically the question is, tell me, do you think a man with breasts is a wonder? Like Rav Yosef, or a monster like a bi? Don't answer that. Uh, do you think a gay person is a wonder like Rav Yosef, or a monster like a bi? Mm -hmm. Don't answer that either. Answer this question. Um, what kind of people are monstrous for you? What kind of difference scares you? What are the differences of human beings in your world that make you uncomfortable? How are we addicted to familiarity and really allergic to difference? What are the differences that make you uncomfortable? I've done this with adults too. And kids say all kinds of things. You know, smelly people, people who are loud, people who are homeless, people who are sick, people who are deaf, people who stutter, people, they, the list, right? Okay. And then I say to them, hmm, what makes difference so scary? So what do they say? Two things. In different forms, they say, I don't know how to behave. Like, I don't know, do I look at the disfigurement or do I look away? Do I say, you know, slow down, your stuttering doesn't bother me, or, or do I not talk about it? Like, I don't know how to behave. So 
your difference disempowers me. I don't know how to behave with you. So I feel disempowered. That's the first thing. The second thing is, it could have been me. I could be the kid who lost a leg. I could have been born black. So vulnerability is profound. Like I feel terribly vulnerable looking at a person who's disfigured. Because I realize tomorrow, I, who knows? Right? And the pain I see is just un- incomprehensible, and I do not want to face it. So, so, of course, we run away from someone who's making us feel vulnerable or disempowered, right? I say, have you ever turned a wonder into a monster? So they say, yeah, I, how do you do it? <coughs> so the answer that some smart kid usually gives is, well, you talk to people. So the reason I do this is because I want them to get that the, the whole conversation here is not about sex. It is about how difference is perceived. And it's a mistake to think that it's easy to be a welcoming shul. Because you, when you make the task easy, no one really, or few people, really know how to do it. If you are honest how difficult it can be, the possibility of actually accomplishing it can grow. In shuls would have welcoming signs above them. A woman loses her husband, and for the week after, everyone's nice. And then three weeks later, her friends aren't calling her up to go out to dinner with her or play cards with her. Why? She represents the potential of losing a spouse, and is just too nervous to be with her. Now, they don't know that, but they sort of... do you understand? So I want to like I want to put on the table that that's what the transgender person does too to us. It basically just throws off all kinds of fears and discomforts, disempowerment, vulnerability, and so when we get that that's what's it wor- working, we can use it more broadly. And so it's not only about gay people or about trans people, or it is about how complicated it is to be a human being and deal with difference, and how all right it is to be. To like love our people and to like familiarity is not a sin. So, so I for me, this is an extremely important thing because I want to be able to understand the person in your shul who's most uncomfortable with these with the with with the work that we're all committed around this table probably to do, which is to find a way to be welcoming of the gay couple into the shul. And where does that come from? So I offer this to you as a kind of introduction. Um, ex- why would it be it's important to explore both the problematics of a, the, more tra- the traditional frame, but also what are the nervousnesses around addressing it? <coughs> okay. Any questions? And I want to dive into the Kedushin frame that we, that we standardly use. Is it here? Yep. And... Um, the problematics of it on the surface for why I think it doesn't make any sense to use them for gay folks, and then what might make sense. So let's dive in. Okay. Um, so we begin with, you know, with, with, uh, with you know, the, the introduction of, of welcoming the couple under the chuppah and, and Bori Priyagat, and that's just an introductory um, celebratory move. Birkate Rusin is really the first ritual frame and Birkat Rusin actually emerged um, around the time that the rabbis were worried that after Erusin, what was happening? Sex. Yeah, people were basically taking Erusin as weddings, and it was instead the betrothal, but there was no permission for sex. And so both families and individuals became tolerant of the young couple starting to fool around before they were married. And so the rabbis threw in a bracha to say, no, no, no. Blessed are you, Lord God, rule of the universe, who sanctified with his commandments, and commanded us concerning forbidden relations. And if it's forbidden us, those who are merely betrothed to us. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but permitted those who are lawfully married to us with chupa and kiddushin. So put on the table, what is the process of, you know, and you, sure, this is review. You all know this from, you know, kind of many frames for our teaching it or in being involved in it. But a rusin is about segregating yourself and your partner out to nobody else. Like basically saying, I close off all the world. Remember that dagger I talked about? That's what Erusin is. Erusin is killing off all other options. It does not permit this one yet. 
What it does is it makes the woman, and because of, you know, like, you know, Rabbeinu Gershom, unfortunately, only because of Rabbeinu Gershom, even men are cut off from any other option to marry any other women. Now, the fact that it's Rabbeinu Gershom in the Middle Ages that actually makes that, you know, happen is actually a bit of the gender dynamics that make the service deeply problematic for anybody, but certainly for gay people. And, of course, you're, I mean, I'm, We'll, we'll, we'll see where this takes us, but no doubt, I can imagine it taking you to wonder whether the gay ceremony I talk about might be employed for straight folks. As I've been asked already to do that. Okay, so that bracha certainly has nothing to do, like there's no context. There's barely any context anymore to do it, because what have we done? We basically collapsed these two ceremonies together, Right? The Isur of Erusin and the Heter of Nisuin are now like 10 minutes apart, 15 minutes apart, right? Depends so, how long you speak. Huh? Depends on how long you speak. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But we've also collapsed the, the communal norms. Yeah. So when we're saying that something is a chuppah, we're saying that it's not even really comfortable to translate or explain it, unlike much of Jewish ritual. Correct. So, well, because the likelihood of the couple being inaugurated into an intimate relationship by the chuppah is probably long gone for m- many, if not most, of our marital scenarios. And so the drama of this, actually, for the contemporary couple, isn't about sex, but about something else. So I think we have to think about that, but it's clear that the text was or- originated to start an intimate relationship. Right, that's what it's orchestrated to do. But, but speaking to, I mean, I, I think that our, that our assumption historically was that the, the people were much, much younger mm-hmm. than you know, were young teenagers. Right. And whereas now... 100%. Yeah. No, no, I think that's right. In fact, that's already starting to appear in my community as people are saying, look, you know, the prohibitions... Mm-hmm. Um, oath of isur nigiyah, of touching and of masturbation, all that stuff, all made sense when you got married by 15. That could make sense when you got married by 15. But if you're not married till 25 or 35, all of a sudden they make much less sense. Right? right. Okay. Um, now, we're going to get into Arayat Mikudesh Ali, but I, 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 I want to just say, in your understanding of Arayat Mikudesh Ali, Betabad Zo, Kedat Yisrael, Kedat Moshev Yisrael, I, my suspicion is, is that we no longer actually take the language seriously in most liberal circumstances. Because mikudeshet literally means, it's like hekdesh. So what mikudeshet does is it basically articulates that the sexual body of the woman is now sanctified, mikudash, to this man. And that that sanctity makes anybody who partakes of it violating the kadosh, the, the kadosh kedoshim, right? Eating, eating sacrifices that are holy is me'ilah. It's like, so, in some sense, it is the sanctifying alone to this man, the man becoming either God and the woman being kind of like the, the, the korban. Like, that's the frame for hektesh. Is, hektesh is the frame for this kedushah. Right? So, the, and, and by the way, at the moment the ring is on the finger of the woman, what happens, at least in terms of our understanding of like the biblical like context of that, is that the moment the ring is on the finger and she is agreed to be mikudeshet, then at that moment all the isure arayot of the Torah, like they fall down from heaven and are like, like a fixed frame of both you know reliability but also absolute prohibition so that that any sexual relation with any other man at this moment becomes cosmic and ultimately associated with kind of like the adultery deserving of death now Mike the question would be is does anybody any longer entertain that that is what they are doing I'm going to just throw in. I wasn't going to I, I'm, I'm asking that question. I was surprised when you said in liberal circles because I think when we say these words now, it's with the understanding 
and we just happen to be doing it with the man saying it first and the woman, which is about to be the equivalent of him. In other words, that it's a mutual... It is mutual, but once it's mutual, and that's what I want to... It's actually where it gets complicated. There's no halachic meaning to that statement. None. It's never, there's never a parallelism within halakha. Well, it's just that the status change of eshet ish happens when the ring's on the finger. She becomes eshet ish. And therefore, her sexual body's owned by that man. There is no parallel. And though she puts a ring on his finger, it has no meaning. Now, let me just say, that doesn't mean, you can basically say that we have constructed such meaning, but there's no ritual frame by which to grab it. Like there's no, so here, by the way, but, but uh, huh? Even with Rabbeinu Gershom, because it's, it's a rabbinic, it's a rabbinic frame that does not make it arayot. It's not arayot. You're violating a decree of Rabbeinu Gershom. I'm going to say that because of this issue, let me say what I've done to solve it with one heterosexual friend, so he was marrying a woman who's very committed to tradition, but an egalitarian. And he too is a rabbi, um, really famous rabbi. He's a really good friend. And he said, yeah, I'd like you to figure out. That. I said, well, here's how to do this. Fix this. You take a neder that if you're, this woman gives you a ring, you commit to her in parallel frame. You are... Other women are asurot to you through neder in exactly the same way that other men are asurim to her through arayot. And you take a neder. If, you, if I get a ring from you, then, you know, something like that. And then, she says, Hare, Ata, Mukudash, you could say, I was nervous to say Mukudash, so I said Mukdash, which means dedicated, but whatever, that, that, the difference, who cares, right? But I, now today I would say Miuchad because I want to get away from all the people yelling at me. So, but nonetheless, <laughs> and Bikabalat Tabadzo, but Tokif Anedra, Asher Nadarta. With the power of the oath you just swore. And then the moment the ring is on his finger, all the isurima, all the isur, the isur of Bal Yachel Devaro, of Nidarim, fall upon him. And it's not the same level as Arayot, but he is, he is wholly, biblically obligated to, and, and when? At the moment the ring is on his finger. So the neder creates, it fills in at least some of the parody that I'm seeking to create. Yes. When, 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 who's saying, who's not saying Harayat? Neither of them. Ah, okay. Because now, you know, my, the people who I work with, they don't want to say Harayat anymore. They want to say any of their And they want, and they want because, to say Because, so I want to say, is it because they are moving away from, you know, it's, I, I mean, in Halakha, it's Hapasa. Hapasa means, it's, it's, it's language in the Darim. It's that, Something is asur, and I use the isur there to actually affect isur here. So I say, this, touching this pen is asur to me like eating treif. So then I've created with hot pasas. Like, so I have to have an isur there to refer to. The isur of arayot is grounding harayat mikudesh The moment you don't say that, and you say, Anila to Dodili, you have not created Kiddushin. You might have created Pilakshut or something mm-hmm. else, mm-hmm. but it's not Kiddushin. You might not need a get for such a relationship, <laughs> right? Which is maybe it's a huge thing. And on some level, you've created, <laughs> on some level, you've created what I would call maybe, I don't know if I'd call it Kiddushin, but you've created Kiddushin bet. You've created the, you know, the 2.0 form of commitment. The problem is, is that. 
it, it, and I'm nervous about this, is that how does it hold the awesome power? Mm -hmm. And me just instead, you know, we've just, we're just um, committing to each other. On some level, it's, I think it's safer, but it, it ratchets down the sense of standing in front of that yawning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. I hear you. My, my second question is, you know, those of us who are um, liberal rabbis and not orthodox rabbis, does it even matter what we do? Because you know, in, in terms of like, the, you know, what some what an orthodox person would say or the orthodox community would say, is that irrelevant? Like, you know, what what we do. You know, is it no. So so, and I'm aware that we, on some level, there are different. Um, like ways in which like uh, 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 we grab at the divine and bring kedusha into you know our relationships and communities and so I don't want to claim like I'm a deep pluralist there certainly I'm I'm committed to all the different ways Jews are going to find a way to manage this I just I know that for my community um, I, I don't I want to be able to hold on to a sense that. Uh, look, I tell I tell this to couples. Getting married is not about you loving each other. It's nice if you love each other. Even if you're going to commit to each other, throw a party. It's great. Don't get married. They said, well, what does getting married mean? Mm. So getting married means that you are committing to stand before God and say, our love is a gift to you to do great things with. You say that to the community too. Our love is is a gift to you, to the whole community, to do big things with. You stand under the chuppah, not to, to affirm your love, yes, but fundamentally to publicly make it a resource for God and for the community to do much bigger things. And that, I think, is articulated in the Shev Brachot, and I, I, I can show you how I think it's there. So I want to, in other words, my point on some level is, is that there's something about the focus on the individual and the romantic topes, tropes of marriage that actually people want more than that. And so the language, the traditional language offers it. And so I want to be able to tell them that stat your status changes forever after that moment, not because you're, like, it's because of some, I would say, some formal frame. Now, if you don't have the formal frame functioning because halakha is not a real, a real category in your world, not you, but the, the people, then maybe you're right. Maybe, you know, it's not there. And so this is a good thing. But I, I'm saying I'm living in a world in which I want couples to be able to feel that this moment transforms them forever in a way that, and it might, okay, good. Right. Supporting your marriage. This is, this is a holy thing. So, can there be kedusha in a marriage that is effectively not a kinyan, but a grief? So, I, 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 so I, I hear you. I just want to tell you that I don't, I, I don't use brit at all, and I actually resist using brit for all kinds of reasons. But I, but I know I yeah. so I do something similar. You'll you'll like what in the end what I'm doing. We will get there. I think you'll like it. You'll like it. But but here's the thing. So I, I, there's something. Follow me with the edginess of this. I know I, I'm I'm not selling it. I'm offering it. Don't worry. I'm supporting anything you do. I'm like I don't care. I it's I just want to say that I'm I'm huh. Marriage, which is not, not in that 
I, I don't know, and I think that's. I think that's that will we'll have to see. I think yes. However, I think yes. However, I'm going to actually be in this space where I think it's hard for me to imagine. Um, I I actually want kinyan in the space. I just want to transform what kinyan means. I want to figure out what kinyan means in new terms. Because I and I so I, Rachel, I love what she does, but I actually think that the loyalty of two has the trope. I like the trope of "you are mine and I am yours" in a way that kinyan actually may represent that in a way that's profound. And I'm not so sure I'm willing to give it up. So get, ho, walk with me a little bit and then say, "No, it doesn't work." I, I I'm not I'm not invested in that. I'm invested in the conversation. I, I um so. Uh, th- this language will not work in any way for gay couples. And so that language that, you know, the Haredi Mikudashim with Tabadzu, moreover, the Sheva Brachot, as you will see, th- and here's, here's Reb Shlomo. Uh, you know, I don't know much of Reb Shlomo, but I did hear him once say, children, children, every, every wedding is a tikkun that is at the beginning and the end of creation. So here's, I learned it from him, and I think it's totally true. The fundamental mythos of a straight wedding is so gorgeous because mm-hmm. every couple is Adam and Eve, mm-hmm. and every couple are harbingers of the Mashiach Tzidkenu. And that is why all, all of the Sheva Brachot are either about Eden or the redemption of, of, the, of the temple being rebuilt mm-hmm. in Jerusalem. Because... Every we are all here because people stood under chuppah and said yes and kept it going. So on some level, every couple we see a couple under the chuppah and we go, that promises a future. There will be a future. The temple will be rebuilt. Let it of the Mashiach will come. Like all our promises of being this people that's going to transform the world. Every couple says yes. And what also do they do? We see that if the entire world were to disappear at that moment, and the only people left standing would be under the chuppah, we could start it all again. Every male and female under the chuppah is Adam and Eve. So, like, we look under the chuppah and we see, literally, we're watching creation and redemption, the beginning and end of history, in front of our eyes. Like, that's what that moment is. So, it's so powerful to grasp that that this ordinary couple stands in that space of beginnings and hopeful futures, that it's just that, it's so incredibly profound. And I think that that's what, in other words, on some level, I want to remove this a little bit from the more Protestant frame of focusing on the emotions of two people. I want to actually take it into these more profound places to an inaugure something that will hold the profundity of what's going on. Yeah. Assuming that the couple is fertile on both sides and intending to go that direction, right? It's totally, and I hear you, and I hear you, I hear you, and no doubt this is going to be, the beauty of this will pose a problem to gay couples for just this reason. But older older couples, but here's the thing, is that, no doubt, like that is all true, and yet we there's something about this, the ordinary scenario in which this happens, which speaks in this way. And we and what do we do? We use the same ceremony because it it should fit everybody. But I, I you know, I kind of think like yes, low pluke, we let we, anyone can come in. You don't have to have kids in order to come in, but. The ceremony still is going to say, you know, which is about your body has the capacity. All, a thousand generations are inside of you. Well, you know, if I'm 70 years old, that may be, you know, the done deal. But, like, we still say that. So I guess I want to put on the table that on some level, there's something really, like, as a straight guy, uh, as a gay guy, I love to do straight weddings. How did I do that? I don't know. <laughs> as, a, as a gay guy, maybe, look, whatever, it's my prior fantasy. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as, a, as a gay guy, I, I love doing straight weddings. So, but, but now, but now, uh, so, 
Um, the other thing I want to tell you is, is that Rivka Luvitz is a, a, is a wife of a rabbi, Ronan Luvitz, is Orthodox rabbi. She's a Toenet Mishpatit, Mishpatit, I think, in Israel. And so they were staying in Boston, and she said to me, so Steve, you do straight weddings? And I said, yeah. And she said, so what's your moral, your moral argument for that? This is a woman with a hair covering. I said, what do you mean? Well, she said, hmm. So if Shimon and Levi came to you and they said, listen, we've known each other for years, and Levi wants to be Shimon's Eved, and um, Shimon is very happy to be Levi's Adon, would you write up the, they asked you to write up the documentation. Would you do it? And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, would you do it? I said, well, no, of course you don't do that. She said, well, then why would you do an ordinary, straight Kiddushin? This is a woman with a tichel. I just want to tell you. <laughs> so, so on some level, like, I, I just want to put this, like, this, here's the thing, and, I, and I'm going to move to the Gisels, we have time, but the reason we tolerate the profoundly patriarchal frame of this entire service is because it is beautiful. And, it, and, and so I want to say that our rituals are just, they're like this. They have these gorgeous music in them, and we trip over elements of them that make us feel embarrassed or, or, or angry. Like, this is not unusual sometimes, right, to find, you know, I get, I get tripped up, I'm not living, and I'm not willing to not say it, and I'm nervous about getting tripped up. So I guess here too, I guess, I, I think we forgive the fact because we love the, we love masculinity, and we love femininity, and we love gowns, and we love tuxes, and we love the beauty of this, this mix of genders that is so profound and old and, and, and fertile. We just, we, it's, it's not unfair that we love it. So I want to put on the table one idea that I can't unpack. I've said before in, earlier in, the, in my trip here, and it's like I think it's so, one of the most important things for all of us to get. The body is not fair, and doing ethics without it is inhuman. The body is not fair. And the, all Wait, the pro- you mean physical body, or are we talking body of literature? The body. Okay. The, this. This. Okay. It's not fair. And therefore, gender isn't fair. Anything in the body is going to actually involve elements of, you know, is it fair that I'm more responsible to my child than I am to a kid in Guatemala? Are they both in the image of God? But my body makes me obligated here more. It's just I'm. That's it. Because I'm human. So I'm going to put on the table that the body complicates ethics and there's no way to do human ethics without it. And so on some level, the liberal theologies are all so profoundly committed to like non-partiality of the spirit that is really important for ethics and sometimes obfuscates the call of the body which has to be heard too. So the call of the body means there's whole theories, there's whole struggle inside of legal theory right now. Is is impartiality immoral? Are there elements of impartiality in law that's immoral? Without it, we can't have fair government with it too much, and we actually stop being human. So there's tensions. I just want to put it on the table. I love this, and there are tensions in it that I can't use in my ceremony. Can't use them. So I have to come up. I can't use the Sheva Brachot. Like, one or two of them will fit, but basically I can't talk about the two men or two women of the Chuppah being a symbolic of the future of, like, children that will emerge out of that partnership to build the temple, to bring the Mashiach. And they don't look like Adam and Eve. And so on some level, to call them Adam and Eve is to lie. And so they don't, they don't want a ceremony... That, that is borrowed from heteronormative frames that, that profoundly doesn't address them. What's needed is a mythos that is alive for gay people. A mythos that makes, that answers the question, what is God up to in the love of these two, these two, these two people? So what God is up to in the love of a man and a woman is in part 
a certain kind of structure of future and continuity and family and all that. And that's big. What is God up to in the love of two men or the love of two women? And until we answer that question and find a suitable way to celebrate it mythically, we're just not providing sufficient gravitas. Like they're not standing in front of God with the full frame of what their love means and what they're offering. So I want to find a way to articulate it and not to simply borrow that heteronormative and particularly patriarchal frame for us. I think it just doesn't fit. And so I won't do it. So th then this is a little bit of what I will do. So okay, yeah. What I struggle with is why it's why there has to be change. Why does one person have to own another person? So maybe they don't. So maybe they don't. But I, I'm not as troubled by it as you. Here's why. I'll tell you why real quickly. The Taz, I'm going to use Shutafut as one of the grounding <laughs> frames. So that, you know, I, I, I accept among Rachel's suggestions, and I think it's a great one. And so I'll have them draw up uh, uh, what I call a star shitufin. Okay? Good. However, um, I think it's insufficient for the task, in part because I think th there's, there, uh, there, there are elements of kinyan that actually feel like they're um, like alive to the psyche. So here's what I do. I looked up and found out that partnership, according to the Taz, means that both are evid ivri to each other. Talk about avdut. Mm -hmm. Both partners are evid ivri to each other. So what does it mean when both? <clears throat> See, Rivka Lubitz's problem is that there's only a one-way avdus. What if there's a two-way avdus? What if we are both, we both subject our body to the service of the other, and it's mutual? That's what shutafut is, according to the Taz. So if that's the case, then all of a sudden, Kenyan doesn't become one person's control of the other exclusively. But it becomes both persons' recognition that they are owned by somebody else and own someone else. Now, you don't, no one, will put it this way. A man doesn't own a woman like he owns a loaf of bread. Because a loaf of bread you can share and a woman you can't. Like it's not, I, it's, I, the ownership is not identical and it's never been identical. It, but the language of ownership is the language of a certain sense of, of like... Um, Claim? Yes, and it allows me to feel like, like I... Um, I've been given entrance. I've been given, I've been given access. Like I, on some level, what does ownership mean? If I want, I can, I can hold it. And some level, I can pick it up, I can use it. So on some level, the mutuality of that is articulated. And so I don't want to, I, I don't have to go any further. Yeah. And, and, and you don't have to buy it. But I'm telling you that I think that I'm not so shocked as long as it's mutual. Okay. Now, I want to show you the process of coming up with both a bracha and a mythos. So, or not a bracha, but a hareat. So you heard what I did with, with um, the straight wedding that I told you about. So I'm doing something similar with the gay weddings. And basically, take a look on page four. Oh, but let's, no, no, like, page three first. So the rabbi introduces the Kenyan ceremony. Here the Kenyan is shutafut. It's not Kenyan of each other's bodies. It's Kenyan Shutafut. Kenyan only means I adopt and commit to a certain set of obligations through the, an act of Kenyan. So what do we do? Each puts in an object into a bag. They lift up together. That's how you do Shutafut. So I use a mezuzah. One puts the cloth. One puts the bayit. They both lift up together. And that actually is the formal frame that grounds the star of Shutafut. So you write the star of Shutafut. You write it in, as you'll see later in the past tense, and, and it, it's the witnesses sign it only after the ceremony. You have them lift up the bag and promise to each other to fulfill a document that will be read that articulates their responsibility to each other. And they put this, they, they do an act that articulates, you know, kind of commitment to it so that it's chal. And then you get the witnesses to sign. 
And that means that there's, there are shutafim in the creation of a household. Now that's great. The problem with Rachel's frame of shutafut is that it doesn't employ any language at all for, for sexual loyalty. It's nowhere in shutafut. And it can't be. Because shutafut can never control sexual loyalty. So it's an exuba with the folk notion. Yeah. The, you, the, the, the star shutafut is like a mutual exuba. Yes, the problem is, is that it, there's no way fully to articulate the isur, the uh, isurin, because there's no there's no sanctification going on in the shutafut. So, in order to to address sexual loyalty in any way, and, you know, and by the way, it's a complicated affair among, no you know, in, in the gay community. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so I have both sides taken in darim. In addition. And both sides say the following. That, oh, but, oh, there's one other thing. I take a, I pull a line out of the of the of the ketubah, and have both say it as they're lifting up the bag. I promise to support you in truth, and it just means I'm basically taking on whatever it means to be responsible for you. If you can't work, I'm working for you. Right? Okay. Turn the page. This is double. It goes both ways. And then the other partner says, And both of them are taking Nidarim to be loyal to each other. Okay. What's wonderful about this, in my view, is I now understand what has been bedeviled me around the reform and the conservative movement's approach to same-sex marriage is that, is that until now no one's written a Gerushin ceremony that I know of that's been published and, and promulgated. So how, what meaning of commitment have you shaped if you do not believe you need an exit strategy? An exit strategy. So on some level, that claims that you're actually not so serious about what you've committed to because you don't actually need to be relieved from it. So I like find that actually a deep problem in the whole structure of the ceremony. Like, let's, the moment you create the, you, the, the obligation, you had better have an exit strategy. Otherwise, you really, like, what, is, what actually are you doing? So the exit strategy here is easy. What is it? Hataran darim. And what's beautiful about Hatara Nidarim is that they each have made independent Nidarim. So therefore, they can get out of it on their own. No one is held hostage to the other because the Nidarim are independent. And so if one says, I need out, and the other says, I can't, I can't no, I don't want, so I'm sorry, but I'm going to a betin. And, I, and all you have to say to a betin is, had I known where this would take us, I thought we would be able to build something together we are not able to. I wish to be relieved from my neder. The, the Beitin basically says, you know, motulach, 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 and basically you're, you're free, you're done. And here's the other thing. Hatarat nidarim is far more articulate of what people really mean when they divorce. That's really what they mean. I want to be free from my promises. Please let me. But that assumes the promises are written in heaven and you can't walk away. So that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to get at. Do you understand? I want to get promises that are not only in my heart or only held by the community, but are written in heaven in a way I feel duty bound to. And I got to go to some austere body to be released. Right? Okay. Sorry, I haven't had any of those yet. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. No divorces. No, no, no divorces yet. But I write up in the prenup and I make them sign a prenup that explains to a Beitin what they have done and gives the Beitin structure by which, if one goes and says, I want to be out, the Beitin says, we will consider Hatarat Nidarim, but you have to wait three months and get at least you know, two sessions. In other words, they'll come up with a process, but the Beitin understands what they have done and what they are to do. Right? Yeah. So I'm uneducated about this, but in American law, in the states where uh, gay marriage is recognized, is there gay divorce as well? How does that play out? Um, I think so. 
I think there's a. Yes. I think so. I, I don't think the state could could make. I, I think you. It, it's the same process. But it's an evolving body of law because they're still trying to deal with it. Right. I'm a little curious, from a, very much from a halakhic standpoint. Um, so my wife and I, both big feminists, when we got married a couple years ago, we did Hare Ani Etz Kadesh, Vah, Kishay At, Tigablit, At Badzo. And then the ketubah we used was Ari Collins, which says after six months, if neither party had sent or accepted a get, after a civil divorce or after leaving the house for the intention of ending the marriage, then everything is null and void uh, from the outset. So why does it need to be like? Well, I'm this, sure, the Arya solution is a really interesting. I'm curious the merits of the neder versus trying to keep it more in that uh, traditional. Because there are no, there's no, there's nothing to my peace. There's nothing to hold on to in in the Doraita frame. There's no, it's all, it's all unarticulated. So the only way to do it is to actually articulate it from the individuals. The, the individuals have to create Isur. Because there is no Isur. So, so I guess... For, for right? Or I no Isur to... The question that I'm asking is, because through our, we did a Shtar Tanayim, we did uh, the, the, um, the, the Kiddushin with the, the, the language, the modified language, and the Ketub itself talks about that we are you know, committing ourselves to this. Uh, so the question is, why does it, is the language of Neder like, necessary? Or if everything else, like you have to have that word, like, I mean, like, no dare, or does, can you, like, does that make or break the contract, the, the language? Well, for me, everything else I can't, I can't. I have no idea, forgive me for being explicit, why if you go out and have an affair, there's anything biblical okay. that happens. But, besides the being a gear show, I, it's not biblical. But. I'm saying. It's like, in other words, I guess I want to create scenario in which you feel accountable to heaven, not just to a not decree of Rabbi right. Gershom. Right. And that accountability has to come from somewhere and it can't come unfortunately, from the Torah right now. So, so where does it come so from? you would only do that for heterosexual as well. I, I, I really prefer... I, I did a heterosexual wedding just a few months ago, and I asked them to, to take the nether, and they agreed. Mm. They didn't ask for it, I asked them. Right. So you didn't get a pair... So the parody was the nether that you add for the, for the groom. The groom makes a nether, and then the woman puts on a, a, the ring and says, by the power, not, you know, Kedat Moshe Yisrael, because there's no such thing, but betokef a nether, she nether with the power of the well, oath you just swore. Yeah, but so it won't exactly be... It's not, it's not exactly it's not parallel. parallelism, but you're that, trying to tweak it so that there is something at stake. Correct. To get that kind of... It, it'll never, it will never, as you say, be equal because, because of nature. And it won't... We can't, it's not fair. And it's not equal. But you put counterweight with the nether to the, that. Well, we, we, might, we might be able to make it fair if we conceive of gender differently. But... Um, but that's a long haul, and right now, um, like, look, I can imagine I have straight couples who want to do the wedding service I'm describing because they do not want kiddushanal because it's too patriarchal. They don't want kiddushanal. Now, let me finish because I want to kind of do the the whole frame, and then we can talk about like what what does this sig- signify for for you and your choices to do this. So, I um. So here's what I do. That you, I, I included two star shitufim that I'm actually using. One I used recently, and one I'm using soon, just to give you a taste of possibilities. I like the second one better because page six, five and six, because I think that it's a document attesting. The witnesses are saying we saw this happen, and therefore I think it's probably a more correct halachic format, but nonetheless, there they are. Here's my mythos. So, you might think it's out of the ordinary, but so, I, I thought about this and it dawned on me. How many of you been to Kiddush Levona in a shul setting? It's not a, it's, it's a very rare thing. It appears in orthodox settings. I don't know any concerted setting I've ever seen it in. It happens on Mosi Shabbos. All the men go outside. They look at the moon. They dance around in a circle. It's the most pagan ceremony you can imagine. <laughs> yes. That's Rosh Hashanah Rabbah. Yeah. 
I, I love it, but here's the most shocking thing about it, is that it's all... The, the bracha is beautiful in itself, of itself. It's baruch mi chadesh chadashim. And so it can mean he who renews moons or he who makes things, all things new, who renews new things, things. Renews things. And, and there's all this uh, uh, speaker response. It's You have to shake people's hands. Shalom aleichem, aleichem shalom, shalom aleichem, aleichem shalom. And you jump up and down. And, and it's like, it's a, and then you, you dance in a circle to a piece of El Adon. I mean, it's really fun. And what is it, what is it founded on? A, the bracha of renewing the moon. In the, the moon's renewal, but two, the mystics in Sfat began to fantasize that the old dim- diminution of the moon would be restored, would be fixed. And so you know the story. The story is from Mishun Bampazi. Anyone want to read it? On, on page seven? A Mishun Bampazi posed the contradiction. It is written, and God made the two great lights, the greater light to dominate the day, and the lesser light to dominate the night. Said the moon before God, Holy One, Master of the Universe, is it possible for two kings to rule with one crown? God said to her, Go and make yourself small then. She said before God, Because I ask a good question, I should ask myself. <laughs> God then said, Go rule in night and even in day. She responded, What good is that? What advantage is there for a candle in the daylight? God said to her, Go and let Israel count her days and years by you. She said, A year calendar cannot function without the solar season. God saw that she was not a priest, and so the Holy One said to her, Bring me a sin offering, bring bring me a sin offering for me, that I diminish the moon. That this is what Rachel Akish meant when he said, What is the difference between the goat of the new moon that it is called God's sin offering? God says, This will be for me an offering that I diminish the moon. It's actually unique language in Rosh Chodesh. It says Khatat Lashem in a very interesting way that basically is read by the rabbis is that God is bringing his own Chatat for diminishing the moon. And the rabbi's prayer for the restor- restoration of the moon to her former glory is it's a remarkable f- scenario. So let's just it, walk it back. Why does the moon complain? What's the complaint that gets her diminished? How did two who are... How did, she, how did two share? So any couple knows that all you have to do is live in the same space for, you know, a day, a week, five minutes, and all of a sudden, like, one second, or who's, who's doing the laundry? Are you doing the laundry? Have I done the laundry? It, could you please squeeze the toothpaste this way? Because it's really <laughs> pissing me off. That, and so, in other words, every two people are always struggling over who's in charge. There is no way not to. Um, creation happens, and God is one. And then everything becomes more complicated when there's two. Because when there's two, power enters into the field as something to concern oneself with. God is, not, God is in power over nothing when God is all. And the moment there's other, all of a sudden, who's in charge? And so the problem of twos, there are two Leviathans, one has to be killed because they'll destroy the world. The sun and the moon, there's two more power. Who's going to be in charge? So God says, okay, well, the moon will be small. In other words, the solution to the problem of two is hierarchy. Hierarchy. Now, any corporate effort knows that there's an element of hierarchy that makes for successful functioning of organizations. I don't like, I'm not against, can't be against hierarchy because otherwise we would be really in trouble as parents. And um, And in general, it functions. However, there's a deep problem, moral problem in hierarchy, particularly in this circumstance, because the moon is marked feminine, the sun is marked masculine. This is actually a stand-in for what's going to happen with Eve, right? She's going to be diminished, you know, and underneath the power of Adam, because two can't make, you know... So anyway, so what does it mean to pray for the restoration of the moon to her former glory? It means to fix that story in which the solution of sharing power is hierarchy. And we're going to fix it. And the, the, we're going to figure out how, to, how two can share a single crown. And on some level, I articulate that two men and two women are under a chuppah because we cannot default to the standard patriarchal frames 
we are playing out. We are the canaries of them. We are, we are struggling to figure out. A gay couple always has to talk about everything. We have to figure out who's... I'll give you the best example. By the way, many couples do it today too because of new equality, but that's what's making that happen. We go to a pre-birth thing in Cincinnati. We're about to have a baby in India, the surrogacy. We go to older couples learning about how to diaper, you know, wash, whatever, a baby. We're the old, there's 50 couples in the room. We're, we're the last ones in. We sit in the front. It's really, everyone's looking at us. Um, and they go around the room. I mean, the woman says, she begins by saying, and now we're going to talk about all the things that you people need to know about having this child, including breastfeeding, relevant to most of you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very funny. And, so, and, then, and then she goes around and points to people to talk about the experience of the child coming into their lives. Every single couple, the woman spoke and the man was silent. I just want to put it on the table. We don't want to acknowledge it. But, like, the hierarchies are there, and we cre create deference around who, whose job it is. Now, all I want to say is, is that Steve and I had to look at each other and figure out who talks. <laughs> it was no presumption. So on some level, what gay people are doing is figuring out how to share a crown with two equals. So I'm, now, is that the best metaphor? I don't know, but what I'm trying to find is what is up to in the love of two men or two women? What is God doing? What is God up to? How profound a question is that? That turns gayness into something different from an annoying problematic we have to make room for and an invitation to a consciousness that everyone needs to gain. Like there's something gay people should be able to teach everybody. So I just think I want to be able to articulate what he's got up to in the proliferation of gay couples. What is going on? And I think there's something spiritual going on that we, this may not be it, find something else. But on some level, I want to be able to help a couple realize they are part of something big. It is not only about their love. They are part of something big. And so in doing this, what I've done is ask couples to consider making elements of Kiddush Levana, part of the Sheva Brachot. And actually, this wedding I am doing in a month, they've done it. They've turned Kiddush Levana, if you look on the back of the Black Bastard pages, Kiddush Levana, elements of Kiddush Levana are, are you know, in here. And it's, it's really beautiful, it's very sweet. If I had my druthers, I would do gay weddings only at the right halachic time where you could do Kiddush Levana and I would only do them outside under the moon. <laughs> Can't always do that. Um, but there is something powerful about giving people the feeling that, that this is a moment of calling. Not, we're not just merely stretching the tradition to make room for anomaly, but we're, we're hearing a voice that's new that is calling us to a new set of religious imperatives. And by the way, actually figuring out how two equals share without hierarchy, how important is that for like a whole array of social and moral and political problems, right? So like, what an invitation to imagine that gay weddings really aren't only about the love of two people, but they're about a transformation in the way partnership is conceived of that more dispenses with hierarchy than ever before. And with that, that that's my introduction to what I'm, how I'm conceiving gay marriage. Okay. I've never thought because there's a lot of pithy phrases that you've used. That so, like yes, <laughs> although I have to be honest, is that I did it earlier in the process, and so not everything you've heard is in it, but I wrote an article for Princeton that ended up being published by Emery, it's in a book called Authorizing Marriage, but I can send it. Will you send it around? Well, so uh, can I send it to one person who can send, send it? it send it to the Board of Rabbis. I will send it to the Board of Rabbis. Everybody you will all get it. Contemplating a Jewish ritual of same-sex union, and I'll send it all. Okay. Yeah. I really like this. I think it's innovative and feminist from my perspective, the renewal of the movement. 
what I'm missing in it is um, individuals and pers pe people images. Because what we have in the Sheva Brachot, though inappropriate here, are images of individuals either laughing children in the, in the redemption thing and shouts of friends and, you know, fries and goose, or the Adam and Eve thing. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, your decision, like, I assume you sort of considered commitments that, like, Ruth made to Naomi or um, Jonathan made to, to David and chose to not put those things in, presumably because they don't really work or whatever. But, 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 but I'm wondering about the dynamic between something halakhic and cosmic and something more personal and right. human. Well, it's a really lovely question. Part of the problem, I do a session called Six Queer Heroes and Scoundrels where I deal with the evidence that they're, like, at least, it's really hard to find lesbians, but at least one can find, like, the reality of the gay characters there. But my read of Jonathan and David is that, is that Jonathan is... And David is a charismatic, beautiful young man brought into the household to man up Jonathan, who was a gay boy. And <laughs> Saul knows that his son needs to be manned up, so he really wants David to influence him and brings him in. But ultimately, Jonathan falls in love with David, as you see in that first scene. And then, in the end, Jonathan is... I mean, it's, it's, it, to me, the text exudes the reality that Jonathan is in love with David and he's gay. And David uses... In, in generosity, but also in self-aggrandizement, he uses Jonathan's love to get into the into the into the king's, you know, good you know good stead, and ultimately to become king himself. And David doesn't love David loves Absalom. Find what and God. He articulates that he loves Absalom. By the way, that the ne'er the son that tried to usurp him, right? Because um, he was like him. It's like self-interested and narcissistic, and he loves God. Does he love anybody? So my my take is that there, I don't really want to use Jonathan and David because I don't think it's a loving relationship. And Ruth and Naomi, it's not erotic. So I just I find that I I don't. Here's what I. But it may be halakhic in that there are interpretations about what that commitment might. The valence of that sort of commitment that Ruth might be making. I, mean, I hear you about the fact that these narratives don't work. But we do have a tradition of taking things radically out of context if we like a piece of it. What the, oh, the only problem I have is, is that I, it's so, it's so, uh, I don't know. I, I, by the way, I, if people want to do it, I just find that it does not ring true to me to talk about a mother and a daughter-in-law with erotic tropes of a wedding. Now, that, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I hear you that I, I, it would be interesting to come up. There are, um, you know, there are beautiful poems by the, you know, medievals uh, between men. But they are, in a certain sense, too personal and erotic to include in a wedding. They're just a little too over the top. I want to find something that works better. The, look, it's not done. It's a work in progress. I'm, I don't, I, 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 this is a first attempt. It's not, I'm not finished with it. There are... There was something which I, I didn't hear you say explicitly. I thought I heard you say implicitly, and I just want to ask you, you know, explicitly. I, I think I've heard you say that um, that the way that you would understand gay marriage or the gay marriages that you're performing is different from how you understand straight marriages. And I think that I've heard you say that straight marriages are about um, commitment um, to each other, to support each other, to do great things in the community, and that that is shared with gay marriages. But that there are two things which are not shared, and that is um, focus on raising a family, at least in theory, like with old couples, whatever, infertile couples, it can't, but at least in theory as a principle of the ideal kind of marriage, that that's not there, and also um, um, exclusive sexual commitment. No, no, so I, that's why the nether is there, because I want exclusive sexual commitment, and I won't do open, people have asked me, I want to get married, but I want it to be an open relationship, and I won't, I won't do it. I think we need to think about that because obviously Yaakov had an open relationship. So um, it's a complicated affair and I'm not, you know, but, I, but I'm, not, I'm not there. But I... I um, I'm funny. I, I, so here's an interesting question. So here's a, here's a piece of this that's complex for me. And I... Um, there, there is something of a disability in being gay that gay people do not like to articulate. 
because you don't want to, like, even today, even deaf people don't want to be considered disabled. So certainly gay people don't be considered disabled. But in a culture that so highly prizes reproduction, like Jesus makes disciples, Abraham and Sarah make a baby. We, reproduction is the way you make good on the promise. And I will never hold a child that is the product of the bodies of, of, of the, you know, my and my partner's body. Never. And so on some level, I have to find a kind of root around to if I want to do family, but it is certainly a different scenario and it's one that includes a great deal of challenge and difficulty. I don't want to exclude it, but it can't be, for me, it's really hard to imagine that it's, it's as central to the ethos of the relation. I want to find a way. Also, the other thing is that I, I probably agree with you that that even there's something problematic around reproduction being so central to the traditional marriage. Because there are people who, all kinds of people who can't have kids. So I, you know, I do tell people that, you know, being fruitful and multiply is not the only way to translate the text. You could, it could be, you know, be fruity and great. And <laughs> <laughs> juicy, juicy, juicy and great. And, and I want to claim that the world needs juicy and great people too. So I, I'm not against the idea, even in the straight frame. That's why, that's why you know, some couples want to use this, because it may be that the limits of the reproductive frame as, the, as such a central port, you know, key is problematic. But look, I'm, it's, I'm, we are suffering and, and loving this all at the same time. Um, it's really about, again, it's really about the body. Like, do I believe a transgender person that her body doesn't matter? What matters is her spirit determining who she is. Like, where does the body fit in our ethos, in, in, our, in our ethics? And on some level, Jewishness disappears if it's all will. Because, you carnal know. Carnal Israel. Carnal Israel. We are the people of the body. But... I haven't, you know, like, that's why I'm like, I want, when Chazal create conversion, they are undermining the body. Intentionally, they are creating a spiritual entrance. Right? It's basically, your mind brings you to Jewish identity. And until that moment, no such possibility existed. The only thing is, is that they repaired it by the fact that once your mind brings you in, what happens? Your body is Jewish and you can't escape because now your body is Jewish. So I want to say there's something about this, about, about embodied like commitment that is hard to de- make not central. So if that's the fact, then on some level, gay couples will feel an, a tinge of disability. And in that sense, I, I, I want to include it as a, as a way to... You know, inc- I want there to be an encouragement for this. Certainly, I, you know, I've done it because I was committed to it. But I'm not sure it can ground the ceremony. I mean, it speaks to what you said earlier about the the troubled intersection between ethics, body, and fairness. Yes. There's just a, it, some things that it seems like it's it's very hard to wrap a mind around and make them feel comfortable to everybody. You too wanted to be six foot and blonde. I know. I I, <laughs> I, I, I agree. Yes. I love that you're going there, but I, I feel the opposite, actually. Um, for me, Jewish tradition is uniquely attuned to human embodiment and mm. the body of the Yes. Yeah. But not in a way that sees a strong dividing line, or emphasizes one, or creates one, um, and, and not with so therefore, not with this kind of uh, struggle or power dynamic between mind and body. So I thought when you said, what happens once you become Jewish and you find your way there, um, you were going to complete the sentence not by saying, you can't get out because now your body is Jewish. You were going to say, you go through Brit and Mikvah. And Mikvah. And Mikvah. Right. And we recognize that 70% of your embodied being is mind. So these are not supernatural waters. This experience is just supernatural. 
the way water is flowing and evolving, you are too. And you're, you don't need this separate from your body. And besides that, we have this corrective narrative that says, by the way, you were, you know, you were standing about somewhere with us. Our shops were there, we were, we were there in the period we existed right. both in that timeless way, Van Eden, incarnation, not kind of, we don't get obsessed about how many angels are on the head of the tent, right? It's somewhat theoretical and just somewhat not physical, but it all is in the felt sense experience in the world. I would say to you, but, um, but do you think that the right kinds of language about Adam and Kaba, this one, Adam and Kaba that is about Ezra Kinego and being a tikkun libinyan a day ad can be about being each other's tikkun. My husband has wanted me to write a book for years. I'm just going to put it out here because my version of copyright it. <laughs> Called Soundmates. As a play on soulmates and also an understanding of what it means to have that kind of yes. Yes. But also the so experience so with the seat, with the seat, right? Because we're soulmates. Um, I would say that in a way the constructed norm, physical norm, is an understanding that many of us are infertile. That, I mean, that's the story we see over and over and over again. And we're nursing each other's children, and we're adopted, and we're raised by somebody else, and this one. We have all these words for nursemaid. Moshe even cries out, right? What did I give birth to them? But this is my equivalent role. We say that the children of Aaron, you know, the Orchot by Moshe. Right. So in a way, I, I think our tradition gives us a lot more resources for saying, don't talk to the gear and don't ever talk to the adopted child as though they are in that is much, as in limameshit. It's like when you feel it that strongly, it's because it actually is real and don't get stuck on biology. Well, so I, I think that Chazal led the way in this path that you're describing. Chazal basically are taking... I mean, there was no way to be a Jew except linearly until, I don't know, the first century, second really? century? Yeah. But Abraham, you know, and Sarah, the whole of the shop, that wasn't all the people who were following No, I don't think so. Politically, you could be a time of children. You know, <laughs> uh, Yaakov, all of Yaakov's children are Jewish, but you know, you see this, you know, you know, Yishayahu talking to the Bnei Nechar who can't get in, can't get in. Politically, you could become a Jew. That's what we lost. We lost this. this we lost this Ger Toshav, this Ger Toshav frame that you could, right. you could, you could, you could be a, a non-Jew living. You could be, you know, Uriah the Hittite. You could okay, be, but you couldn't be a Jew. And then, and then, on some level, at some juncture, uh, we we um, made it different. But the question would be this: Is that you know, is Jewish? Can can would you imagine ultimately that it all of a sudden that the body doesn't matter? Like on some level, that's the we're being pulled toward. I mean, I'm being pulled as both a leader in this community. To making the body matter even less, the body matter even less. Uh, no, no, no. See, okay. For, oh, first of all, I should say I'm going to bolt no matter how you dress me because special with the CLA is my But, but first of all, I really want to thank you because I have been trying to get a sense of where the bliss comes from from the Orthodox world. Um, and that sense, in which what I think you know now, of course, is that sense of disability of which you speak certainly doesn't apply to this young generation of queers for whom gender is a sex boy. Gender is a sex boy. It's a it's a it's, it's a fun thing in one place. Yeah. But it's, but they're having very embodied experiences. But I I think I'm understanding how how the, the real, the real intense birth that your journey required through a narrow place, and I really, really appreciate that. And I don't think that I've got the, the us before, so I'm really grateful for that. Wow, thank you. Um, and I also want to offer a Jewish model of a country that has to do with study from Ravashi, from one's, from, you know, one's students. So again, I... Part of it is because you know, I have other is my teacher, and I. Why is the grief, which is the relationship between Israel and Hashem, not a sa- a holy, not even a sacred, but a holy yeah. model? So I'll tell you very simply: you can't get out of a Brit. 
That's the whole point of Brit. You can't get out of a Brit. God can't get out of it, and we can't get out of it. And so I don't want to do a Brit. There's no ceremony of Brit between two people that we now do, halachically, in part because a Brit is, a, is like, it's different. It's not, it's eternal. And I don't want to make a wedding a Brit. I want to make it something else. A Brit scares me because I think it's just... Uh, on some, uh, whatever, that's it. That, I think that, you know, w- when we fail the, the relationship, God cannot get rid of us. He has to basically yell at us until we comply. And we, the other way around, we can't get rid of God. What, but formally, that language doesn't provide it. I'm not saying that there couldn't be, but I'm saying the word breed doesn't have another Hebrew word that describes the process of getting out of it. And on some level, what makes marriage an all right institution is that there's an exit strategy because otherwise it ends up becoming quite incarcerating. So for me, I like... <laughs> cellmate. <laughs> cellmate. <laughs> Um, it certainly fits the language of your sword uh, speech before they get married. Meh. You know, if you're getting them to the, take, the, you know, to, uh, you know, fall on their sword, there you go. <laughs> well, I think it's also, I, the, the challenge is it's been interesting for me how Brit has been reinterpreted in general, whether through this or otherwise, because a lot of Britot, at least in their original form, have that element of hierarchy. Yes. They're, they're not yes, yes. The suzerain, the suzerain relationship is highly high, very hierarchical, and God in Israel is very hierarchical. And, so, I, in other words, it's not it's not as flowery and beautiful as one might originally think. And so, I, I, I'm like I'm, I would rather use a metaphor that is a little bit more human and a little bit scaled back, but then imagine that it's auguring some kind of heavenly awareness and engagement. And that so that nidarim helps me make it seem like, um, look, this is, you know, uh, the, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in this frame. I think so many people are eager for this sensibility and it's so hard to reach in a contemporary environment. My Aunt Charlotte was suffering from the beginnings of Alzheimer's. She called me up, you know, she was, you know, she passed away a number of years ago, but she called me up when she was still, you know, still functional, but beginning to lose it. She said, I'm, a fr- I'm frightened because I am losing grip on my very life. I'm forgetting it. And I uh, said to her, something I never thought before. You know how it is as a rabbi that sometimes heaven is generous and we come up with the words that we had never thought to say and there they are. And so grateful after the conversation. So I said, Hashem zochechet kol nishkachot. We say it on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. God remembers everything, all the forgotten things. It's said on Yom Kippur a little bit threatening. <laughs> God remembers. If you, but how beautiful. Now nothing Nothing is forgotten. And Charlotte, it's all remembered in heaven. It's all going to... The moment that, that you are in touch with heaven, every last detail will come back in full color. Don't worry, it's not gone. I think we all want to be witnessed. We all want our lives and our choices to have, have felt like they had, were etched above. And we are held accountable to that. And that is different than holding the entire weight of our relationships only among ourselves. And so this is an attempt to actually accomplish a little bit of that. Um, I, I 